channels and you might not have picked the best one. <laughs> it wasn't obvious. So I just don't tell everybody because we want to have a conversation. <laughs> and if we, but uh, you have picked the best panel because I know these guys. Um, anyway, thank you all for being here. I'm Paul O'Brien and I work for Oxfam America. And this is a conversation about the relationship between inequality and the wealth gap and everything else that we're here to try and be relevant to the reduction of poverty and injustice in the world. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating this conversation, so I'm going to introduce uh, the three panelists. They are uh, great people and great thinkers, and I'm hoping we're going to have a real conversation. Here's what I would like to do, if I could. I'll introduce them. Um, I'll ask them a question and get them going, let them speak. I've told them speak. I've never done this before, but I know these guys, and so I told them speak as long as you like until you think you're getting boring, and then stop. Um, and then we're going to have uh, a little bit of a q and A. I I can throw out some questions, but I'd love you guys to, to put forward provocative questions yourself. In my book as a moderator, a question does not sound like, hi, my name is X, I'd like to tell you the 14-point program we're doing to reduce inequality and then ask you what you think about that. That's not a question. <laughs> a question is something that's really provocative that gets these guys going, well, let me be frank. <laughs> so do try and think of something provocative to say. And uh, we will have as best, uh, a conversation as best we can. Okay. To my left, who I'll ask to speak first, is Alex Thier, USAID's assistant to the administrator for policy planning and learning. Um, I think you probably know this, but the PPL Bureau is USAID's center for policy development, strategic planning, learning, and evaluation, and partner engagement. Um, before that, Alex ran uh, the largest development program in USAID, formerly known as the Office for Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs. Um, which, of course, was a really easy time to do that. And before that, he lived overseas. I got to know Alex many, many years ago in Afghanistan. What I'd just like to say about him is that uh, Raj Shah made a bet, made a promise years ago that he was going to reestablish USAID as a thought leader in the world. And uh, that was one, it was at a time when reforms at USAID were not the kind that President Bush could offer big new initiatives like the MCC, it was about improving the quality of the work. So saying that you're going to reestablish USAID as a thought leader was really an important pledge, and he asked Alex to lead that way forward, so you should have high expectations of his insightfulness. Um, I'm next going to ask Beth to talk. Uh, this, is this was highly negotiated, the order, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, Beth uh, is the Millennium Challenge Corporation's Vice President for the Department of Policy and Valuation, so leads the thought shop at MCC. Um, she's responsible for directing MCC's policy development, economic analysis, program evaluation and learning, and their threshold program. In this capacity, she leads the MCC in managing the annual country eligibility process promotes policy improvement in partner countries through MCC's operations, oversees the technical economic analysis and rigorous evaluation processes that underpin MCC's engagement with partner countries, and advances learning and sharing of best practices internally among US government agencies and internationally. And that's before lunch. Um, I got to know Beth. Uh, as she herded a group of cats who claimed to share a common agenda to modernize foreign assistance in the United States. And with grace and alacrity, she managed to convince us all week in, week out, that we were part of one big team. And actually, I think we did deliver some good things under her leadership. So um, it was in that guise, and uh, I will expect you to find, no matter what she says, however provocative it is, you will find yourselves agreeing with her. It's very frightening. Um, John Norris, my, our last panelist, is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., and a member of the President's Global Development Council. He served uh, in a number of senior roles in government, international institutions, and nonprofits, including with the United Nations, State Department, and the International Crisis Group 
John has written for a whole range of uh, uh, papers and magazines, The Atlantic, Post, Foreign Policy, and he has a book coming out, which you should buy in September, about the great journalist Mary McGrory. Um, uh, I know John a little bit through uh, working on, uh, we co-chair a group that works together, and I have the distinct displeasure of taking half an hour to say what he manages normally to say in a couple of sentences. Um, which sort of generally uh, annoys me. Um, he is one of the three funniest people on this panel, so you should expect to see some, some witty uh, asides from him. And uh, let me leave it there. Um, uh, but it is hopefully going to be an informal, serious, but also um, hopefully a provocative conversation about a very challenging problem that we face in the world today. Extreme inequality, it is growing, it's not going to stop anytime soon. That's what the research says, I'm sure you've all heard about this Piketty book. Warren Buffett acknowledged that fact last week. Um, we now have 80 people who own as much on this planet as the poorest half of the population. And very soon, 1% are going to own the same amount of wealth as everybody else put together. Oxfam put out those facts last year, I think maybe the year before, and it was the biggest news story and campaign story we'd ever seen in our history. And we'd done some big campaigns on trade and other things. People came to us and said, this is the conversation we ought to be having. They came to us, though, in two respects. One of them, one group of folks were, were saying, finally we're having a conversation about what it's going to take to lift people out of poverty. And the others were saying, why are you doing this? Um, poverty is about poor people and you're talking about the wealthy. So why are we sitting here having a conversation about inequality? I think that's a, a, an interesting uh, conversation for us to mull on today. Um, and I'm going to start. Uh, and come back to that if, we, if the comments haven't fully gotten to it, by asking Alex a question. One of the things that I've been witnessing uh, over the last while is the US government begin to really find its voice in leading the development community in a very important year, 2015. We have big conference coming up in Addis Ababa in a few weeks, in <coughs> July. We have new goals coming in September. Alex has been on the forefront of that. Um, and he knows that tackling global inequality isn't going to be about donors or aid. It'll be about developing countries deciding to strengthen their own public finance management systems to make them more fair and more progressive. So I want to ask him, what is USAID doing about inequality now? What is it thinking going into these conferences uh, about profiling inequality in the right way? Alex, to you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's great to see everybody, and uh, I'm glad that uh, during that long introductory period, the room filled in. That was um, the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's also wonderful to be here with Beth and John. Um, I actually worked for Oxfam many, many years ago, um, and I will say that that methodology of raising your 14-point plan and then asking somebody what they think about it is actually the Oxfam training manual. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, we love Oxfam because they are uh, such effective advocates, and I really appreciate Paul asking us to talk about this incredible, uh, this incredibly important topic in what just always bears repeating because it, every day when I wake up, I, it, it just profoundly strikes me what an incredible moment this is and what an incredible year. In July in Addis Ababa, we will have the next in the series of three financing for development summits. Uh, that will be followed by the 70th UN General Assembly, which will establish the next round of global development goals for 15 years. So you think about every year, the successors to this panel are gonna be sitting here and talking about these goals. Uh, and then you have a climate summit in Paris in December and one of the most interesting things about this whole process has been how uh, what uh, some have referred to as the different tribes of climate and development um, have started to interspeciesate, if that's the right word, 
Um, uh, there has been some cross-breeding because now when we talk about development, we talk about climate um, and vice versa. Um, and it's really important and it's, it's profound because what is happening is that the agendas from both of those summits are affecting each other and they are affecting the way we talk about financing for development and this whole top line idea of what it's going to take uh, to deal with the world that we live in that to this day suffers from a degree of inequality that can be and I think is to many of us just fundamentally unacceptable. We live in a world of such evident inequality uh, that Paul has already described through some of these statistics, but it's worth remembering that every day, even as new billionaires are minted, which is an important story, um, the really important story is that there are still one billion people in the world who live in extreme poverty. And can we tolerate continuing to live in a world where we clearly have the means and the resources to end extreme poverty? And hopefully the global resounding answer to that question, which is going to be the number one outcome of the summit in September, is no. That world leaders are going to get together to declare an end to extreme poverty by 2030. Uh, but we have to think seriously about what it will take to get there. And that's where the story of inequality becomes very important. Um, and some of the mechanics behind it. And so I want to talk about this a little bit at two levels. First of all, almost at sort of a philosophical level, which I promise will be brief, and then at a mechanical level. The philosophical level, I think, is that the world has begun to pay increasing attention to this question of inequality, and in fact, there is a proposed goal within the Sustainable Development Goals on reducing inequality because it strikes us all that our aspirations for our lives and our families and our children and our societies are those that are shared by every single person who is born on this planet. But where you are born largely determines whether you will be able to fulfill those aspirations. And I think that if we are going to be serious about dedicating the amount of political and fiscal resources that are necessary to end extreme poverty, we have to be in the frame of mind, not only that it can be done, which is a big, big change, because I don't think most people today believe it can be done, let alone until recently, but that it must be done. That we're not going to be able to succeed in our own aspirations as people unless we are able to address the fundamental inequality that keeps a billion people in extreme poverty today. But we also need to think a little bit about the mechanics of why inequality will actually prevent us from reaching that goal. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I do want to say something about the good news, which we can't lose sight of, which is that Millennium Development Goal number one, cutting the percentage of people living in extreme poverty in half between 1990 and 2015 was not only achieved, but it was achieved five years early. And what that actually tell us is that global inequality is actually not rising. It's falling. More people have been brought out of extreme poverty in this period of time than at any other time in history. The problem is that the inequality between countries, between countries like ours and the Democratic Republic of Congo, remains so profound as to almost be unrecognizable as living and existing simultaneously um, on the same planet. So I'm going to stop for a second and play a quick game. Who likes to play Would You Rather? Uh, it's a I play it almost every night with my kids. I won't go into some of the things that they ask. But let me just ask a would you rather. So raise your, raise your hands if your answer is the first one. Would you rather be poor in a rich country in the lowest 10% or rich in a poor country? So who would rather be poor in a rich country? Who would rather be rich in a poor country? 
Well, I'm delighted to say that most of you are profoundly wrong in your assessment. <laughs> it is actually true, on average, for the wealthiest countries that the top, the bottom 10% have an average income approximately three times higher than the top 10% in the poorest countries. And the reason I want to tell you that that's so profound is because there is today a set of countries out there that are doing incredibly well and we should applaud that. There is a large and growing group of countries who have done tremendously well in the past few decades, helping almost a billion people break the bounds of extreme poverty. But there is still a set of countries, those that many of you want to go and live in, um, where you would be profoundly poor despite the changes that have happened to the global economy. So let me just give you two reasons why inequality is so problematic. We believe fundamentally that inclusive growth is what brings people out of poverty. And fortunately, that's beyond just a gut feeling. It's pretty well borne out by the incredible amount of data that is now available to us from rich and poor countries alike. Inclusive growth is the thing that is responsible for about two-thirds of the rise of people out of extreme poverty. It is the thing that sits at the heart alongside good governance, democratic governance, in our nation's first ever uh, presidential decision directive on development, which you can find online. Um, that idea that inclusive growth and good governance are what ultimately carry societies and carry people out of extreme poverty. So if you want to achieve inclusive growth, inequality is not your friend. And why? Let me give you two reasons. The first is that empirically, inequality slows growth. Why does it do that? It does that because you are not using, and forgive this horrible term, your productive assets which are your people. You are not using them as an engine of your economic growth. This is something we've seen so profoundly in the statistics, particularly about women and girls and the lack of participation of women and girls in the economy. The second, which sounds a little bit like a truism, um, is that if growth is not inclusive, the poor don't benefit. In other words, if you have an unequal and uh, your, your, your economy is growing in a way that, that does not uh, reverse inequality, then the poorest of the poor are not going to be benefiting and therefore you're not going to be bringing those people out of extreme poverty even if you are experiencing growth. So let me just give a couple of quick examples of what that looks like in practice. Take Nigeria. Nigeria is an engine of what inequality and growing inequality can look like. With not only an economy uh, that is based on things like uh, natural resources, uh, oil in particular, that can be profound drivers of inequality, but the social and economic and particularly political consequences of that type of growth have had a profound impact on their society so that certain regions have benefited tremendously, others have not benefited, creating conflict, creating political disaffection, and the recent happy-ish outcome of the election notwithstanding, um, the impact of that inequality has been profound on that country. But at the same time, even in a place like Nigeria, we have focused tremendously on things like education, and particularly on early grade reading. Because one of the things we know about the poor is they don't send their kids to school, and when they do, those schools are often poor, they don't teach them anything, and the kids leave to go on and do something else. So one of the things that we've learned is that by focusing on early grade education, basic education, in the most profoundly disaffected communities, you get these sort of multiple benefits. Another great example uh, because of the recent earthquake is Nepal. Um, Nepal is coming out of conflict, trying to build economic growth. In fact, they've had some profound advances against extreme poverty in the last couple of years. 
but their political fragility, and as we've seen, fragility as a result of things like an earthquake, are the very things that will set countries like Nepal backward. Uh, Ebola and in West Africa, very much the same story. Uh, challenges of drought in the Horn of Africa, very much the same story. So we focus on what we call resilience. Resilience is that idea that we need to be using our development investments to look ahead at the crises that many fragile societies will endure and to invest in the things that will prevent those crises or at least prevent the depth of their impact. So, unbeknownst to many people, and you can find this on the website, we didn't just put it up, uh, USAID in Nepal for the last decade has been working on a strategy because we knew that earthquake was coming. We all knew, eventually. I was in Nepal in November and people were talking about it. I met folks who were doing joint training on disaster risk reduction in Nepal in November. Those types of investments have critical long-term consequences and they are the things that are ultimately going to stop some of those poorest countries from backsliding. Uh, the last thing, um, uh, the, the last two examples that I want to give um, are uh, one uh, is that two years ago in Africa, President Obama launched something called Power Africa, something that the MCC, USAID, OPIC, other US government are partners on. Now, the idea behind Power Africa is twofold. One, Africa needs more energy, hopefully clean energy, if it's going to experience inclusive economic growth. If you've ever seen a graph of energy access and growth, they are like those uh, intertwined snakes on the, the medical staff. Uh, you do not get inclusive growth without access to energy. Now, while we obviously do not want a carbon century in Africa, we want to avoid the worst impacts of growth there, that growth needs to, that energy access needs to be there and it needs to be for the poor. It can't just be for in the urban areas, it needs to get throughout the country. So increasing megawatts, increasing access are the big priorities there. But we can't pay for that. The world can't pay for the amount of, uh, the, the, the public donors can't pay for the amount of energy that's needed. Uh, but the money is there because energy is actually good business. And so the beauty or the idea behind Power Africa is that we use a little bit of our public funding to unlock deals that the private sector are ultimately going to be the major investment partner in. Because we're talking about trillions of dollars of investment needed in infrastructure, not even billions. Nothing that no, even emerging donor, will be able to pay for. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of domestic resource mobilization. Because the holy grail, the light at the end of the tunnel for every single country is that they will pay for their own development. I can assure you, nobody wants to be a ward of the international community. Uh, and there are voices famously from the poorest of the poor speaking up. Ethiopia has been a leader in talking about how they want to develop their domestic resources to pay for their own development. And so, and if you look at what pays for development today, domestic resources outshine everything by miles, whether it's foreign assistance, whether it's foreign direct investment, whether it's remittances, whether it's private philanthropy. That's really where the resources are. So those resources have to grow, even in the poorest countries, but equally importantly, they need to budget transparently, uh, they need to spend money on the development goals that they want to accomplish. Those resources need to be going to the right places. So we're working closely with a number of partner countries, both donors as well as uh, developing countries, to come up with an idea which is for uh, our Financing for Development Summit and beyond about how we can elevate the investment in domestic resource mobilization ultimately to give those countries the tools to pay for their own development and to graduate and to end the profound inequality uh, that so many of us spend our days and nights struggling against. Excellent start. We're off and running. 
Beth, you, has he left? What has he left for you to cover? Oh, it was a tour de force. I, just, I was just sitting there going yeah, like this. I thought it was great. Well, it is interesting that, that there's such a convergence of interest from USAID and the Millennium Challenge Corporation around this idea of inclusive growth because the MCC was set up, right, to, to try and spur uh, economic growth in the world as the pathway. And so uh, really interested to hear your take on how we're doing on the, on the inclusive growth front and, and what is the MCC take on, on that agenda? Happy to provide it. And we should be very well um, uh, synced up because we're all part of one big, happy U.S. government family. So much family, more fun when you're so. not, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Those who are hoping for fireworks, there will be none. Um, I, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we'll see. Uh, we'll wait till John. John is the fireworks here, as we all know. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the tell, why don't, show of hands. This is not as fun as Alex's show of hands. <laughs> I won't ask would you rather. Um, but uh, tell me how many of you are familiar with the MCC model. All right, so most of you, um, which is good. So I'll give the very brief elevator speech, which is that uh, MCC was created during the Bush administration with the express purpose of uh, fighting poverty uh, through economic growth, um, reducing poverty through economic growth. And we do so in a way um, that is relentlessly transparent, um, very systematic, um, very focused on country ownership and creating uh, ownership and capacity among our partner countries. Um, and here's where I just want to give a little nod to Paul, uh, because Paul gave, uh, he gave all of us introductions, but he didn't introduce himself particularly well. And I would say that Paul, more than anybody, I spent a long time on Capitol Hill, and I think when I came off Capitol Hill, I very much had this notion that, well, it's the US government that does development overseas. Um, and then I started working with Paul at Oxfam and others uh, in the advocacy community on foreign assistance reform. And, uh, and he sort of relentlessly drove home the point that the US government doesn't do development. Countries develop themselves. And, and we enable that process. We help to bolster that process. And I think that's really the underpinning of the MCC, which is not how can we go to countries and do things, but how can we work with countries to help them achieve their goals. And that's sort of how we're all set up. We have a very transparent eligibility process and selection process. I brought my prop, which I never go anywhere without. That's why I'm so popular at parties. Um, <laughs> it's our scorebook. Uh, and we are very transparent about how we measure countries' eligibility. We have a series of 20 third-party indicators um, that are not, it's not data that we collect, it's data that other people collect. Um, and countries need to pass uh, 10 of those indicators, and including two hard hurdles, one on corruption and one on democratic rights. Um, and if they do that, then they are eligible to be selected as a partner country. Um, and then those countries that we select, we, um, we work with them to develop compacts. And our compacts are based on an analytical framework that we start with called a constraints to growth analysis, which is a growth diagnostic where we actually work with countries to uncover what the binding constraints to economic growth are in those countries. So it's not that we go in with sort of a gut feeling. Um, we have the luxury of our funding not being earmarked. Um, so we can go in and do anything really that the constraints analysis points us to. And then once the MCC and the partner country agree on what the focus of a compact is going to be, we invite the country to, to propose what a compact would look like. And that starts a negotiation between MCC and our partner countries about the shape of a compact. Um, and we have a number of professionals who do everything from economic analysis to people who are sort of roads experts and energy experts and water experts who help to, to work with these, these country partners to shape the, the compact. So elevator speech over. Um, we, we asked ourselves, um, we asked ourselves not too long ago uh, what inclusive growth looks like in MCC partner countries um, and in the pool of countries that we choose our partners from. And we also asked ourselves, you know, is our methodology, the analytic framework that we use to decide who we're going to work with and what we do, is it pointing us in the right direction and is it actually achieving, um, achieving uh, inclusive economic growth rather than, um, than simply economic growth? Um, and so we did what we always do at MCC, which is we do a study. 
um, and we're very, I would say, a, a very deliberative organization. Um, we did a study, we looked at our, our peer organizations and invited them to come in and present about how they approach this issue. Uh, USAID came in, IMF, ADB, um, World Bank, and others came in. Um, and then we actually took a look at the experience of poverty reduction through economic growth, specifically in MCC countries. And we, what we looked at specifically was the relationship between growth and incomes for the bottom 20 and 40 percent of the population in those countries and, and how that related to average income growth. Um, and this was essentially a, a repeat, a sort of focused repeat of a study that the World Bank had done in 2013. Um, and the good news is, is that what we found is among our partner countries, um, when GNI per capita, average GNI per capita increased 1 percent, um, in our countries, there was an, uh, an increase of 1.21% in the average income of the lowest 40% of the population and 1.16% in the average income of the lowest 20%, um, which essentially meant that in those countries, gro average growth um, and average growth mirrored the growth in income of the lowest 40% of, of the population. Um, and the results for our partner countries, the ones we actually work at, uh, work with, um, were better than the results for sort of all of the candidate countries, which are the poorest countries in the world. So essentially what this means to us is that there's a strong correlation between the kind of countries that we work with and, uh, and inclusive growth. And it, it sort of makes sense. Like, it's not rocket science. It's more common sense than anything else, which is that if we're only working with countries that are poor but relatively well-governed, that have actually demonstrated a commitment to things like investing in their own people, um, economic freedom, ruling justly, um, that those types of things, maybe not any one thing, but different combinations of those things would lead to a better environment for the poor in those countries. And again, we're working with poor countries, so the poor are still poor. They're still problems. Um, you know, the, the situation isn't rosy necessarily, but we have a really good um, basis upon which to build. Um, and I think that the, the picture's pretty complicated. Um, I actually was talking to Paul right before this about something that the World Economic Forum put, up, put together. It's a sort of a discussion document, a discussion framework called Benchmarking Inclusive Growth and Development. So I, I'm sure I like it because it includes a bunch of indicators. It, it's a process. It's like this framework that includes a bunch of indicators that look very much like MCC indicators. Um, but it essentially provides a framework through which you can look at different countries and try to see, you know, is there inclusive growth in those countries and is there not? And it's a basis for discussion that they're going to be sort of using over the next couple of years. I encourage you all to take a look at it because it is really interesting to see the correlation between these indicators that they choose and, and inclusive growth. Um, and provides a good basis for discussion. Um, but, you know, we, we felt like this was good. This was validating information for us to have. We're working with the right countries that have some sort of uh, commitment to their poor and to lifting their poor up along with the rest of the country. Um, but what we also always do at MCC is try to figure out, okay, we might be doing well, but how can we do better? Um, we're definitely not doing everything we could be doing. So first, um, we, you know, we've decided we're going to continue to use the same constraints to growth model that we've used in the past. It works for us. Um, it really does provide a good analytical framework um, from which you know, our compacts can actually be developed. Um, it, it helps to narrow down the group of things that we're going to focus on so that we're not going all over the place in our compacts and actually focusing our assistance on something that, um, that really will lead to economic growth in a country. Um, and it, you know, it, it stems from our belief that, um, that growth is necessary for sustainable poverty reduction and that private investment is central to broad-based growth. Um, and that's sort of at the basis of everything we do. But in some cases, we could be working with a country where growth is less likely to be inclusive. Um, and so in those cases, we will expand our analysis to include evidence about how past growth has been shared in a country and how poverty could be better eliminated through economic growth. So again, you can always do better, and so we should be looking at how the benefits of economic growth can be shared in the countries that we're going to work in. Um, we're also, we also, in all cases, um, don't just do sort of a, a constraints analysis. We integrate two other streams of analysis into that constraints to economic growth analysis. One of them is a um, social and gender analysis. 
um, which actually looks at you know, how gender is, how gender figures into the development challenges of a particular country and how disadvantaged groups might figure into the development challenges of a particular mm -hmm. country. And we also do an analysis of the private investment opportunity in a country. And those two analyses, they're not, they sort of don't sit out here, they're not you know, walled off somewhere. They are very much part and parcel of the overall economic analysis we do and help to inform the types of things that we might focus on with our compacts. Um, and we recently began synchronizing these processes better. It used to be more of a sequenced, um, a sequenced uh, uh, process, and now it's more of a synchronized process. Um, and then we also conduct beneficiary analysis, something we used to do at a somewhat later stage in our compact development and are actually trying to do a bit earlier in our compact development. And by beneficiary analysis, I really just mean we're trying to sit down and say, okay, if we do this project, who's gonna benefit from it? Um, and not, not just, you know, not who sort of specific people, but who from an income profile to make sure that when we're actually deciding how we're gonna put these compacts together, we have a sense of how many poor people we're gonna be able to hit with these projects. Um, and to be honest, you know, in some cases, it's a trade-off. Um, we also conduct uh, cost-benefit analysis on all of our proposed projects and um, come up with an economic rate of return. And we have a threshold economic rate of return of 10%, which many of you know. Um, the economic rate of return and the number of, um, there is often an inverse proportionality between between the, 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 the economic rate of return and the number of poor beneficiaries that you can um, support with any one project. And so you need, to, you need to actually take a really careful look at that and figure out what you're trying to achieve through the projects you're trying to, to, um, to do. Um, so all this analysis is, I mean, sort of mind-boggling, um, and that's not all. We still do a lot of due diligence analysis and other studies when we're developing these compacts. How does that actually all play out in real life? So a couple things, and you know, I'll just harken back to what Alex was talking about in terms of Power Africa, and that Power Africa is not just about you know, making sure that there's electricity in a country, it's actually making sure that people can have access to that electricity. Um, and we've gone, we, we've done, um, we have developed a couple of compacts that are purely uh, power focused, and we are in the process of developing additional compacts that are purely power focused. And in a couple of, of examples, you know, we've done things like willingness to pay studies where we've actually gone out and, and looked at the population and asked the population, how much are you willing to pay for electricity? Um, can you actually afford to get connected to the grid? If there was some transmission line that went by your village, could you afford to actually get that, that, um, that electricity into your house? Um, and you know, are we, through the projects that we're going to do, when we're building a transmission line, when we're building a distribution network, are we gonna hit, are we gonna hit the poor or are we just going to benefit um, people who are not in those, those sort of bottom rungs? Um, and from that, the types of projects that we've developed include things like off-grid electricity access, um, so people for whom the cost of, of access to the grid is prohibitive um, can potentially benefit from off-grid electricity. Um, energy supply chain entrepreneurship models so that women and other marginalized populations can actually benefit from some of the off-grid stuff we, we're doing and, and use it as an opportunity to sort of get a leg up. Smart subsidies or pre-financing mechanisms for connecting poor households. Um, and, uh, and, you know, reviewing a tariff structure uh, to promote social inclusion while still ensuring that, that the utility can have cost recovery. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, that's, I think, where our sweet spot is, which is, you know, it, it can't be unsustainable, right? Um, we're not there just to sort of give. We're there to make sure that whatever we're providing, whatever we're putting in place is actually going to be sustainable. And that's where you have both social inclusion and cost recovery as, as key pillars of something like this. Um, and also ensuring that you know people understand how you can use electricity productively. Um, you know there there are certainly reasons why you why you want it in your home, but you can also start you know small industries with with electricity as well, and sort of training people to understand what those opportunities are. Um, and then I would say finally, um, just something to call it in our Zambia compact. Um, there's it's very focused on water and sanitation um, and drainage and hygiene. Um, and when we looked at whether poor households were actually going to be able to take advantage of the um, compact financed sanitation network, 
um, we saw that there were two particular challenges there. Um, and one was, um, one was that people could not afford to connect to it. So again, it's the connectivity. It's the same thing as electricity, essentially. Um, and the second is that um, water and sanitation networks couldn't be built in, in unplanned settlements. And a lot of the extreme poor were living in settlements that weren't really official places for people to live. Um, and so one of the things we did, um, and this gets into sort of the importance of policy and institutional reform in inclusive growth, is conditioning funding on the government developing um, a sort of financing mechanism for collecting the poor. So they actually had to come up with a solution for how to make sure the poor could access what we were, um, what we were providing. And the second is, is, uh, is including an, an innovation grant for pro-poor pro service delivery, um, which would actually focus on trying to solve sanitation and water access issues for these folks living in unplanned settlements. So those are just sort of two of the, the ways that we get around um, get around the, the challenges when you're doing infrastructure of making sure that infrastructure and inclusive growth are not opposed to each other, that they actually are, uh, are one and the same um, or can coexist and, and enhance each other well. So, thank Great. you. Thank you. So our last intervention, then we're going to open it up. That was super, Beth. Thank you. Uh, we're going to open it up for um, uh, debate and discussion. Uh, John, but I'm, I'm going to riff a little bit off these guys and ask you to speak to something I, I know you think about, although I'm not sure exactly what you were going to say. you probably say it anyway. Um, President Obama called this issue the defining inequality, the defining issue of our time. You sit on his Global Development Council. Um, it, it, it would be great to hear your reflections on, on how you think the, the remaining period of the Obama administration is going to prioritize or not inequality. Uh, hopefully it will after that declaration. But I am sort of intrigued by the fact that listening to both Alex and Beth, I think we need to have, a, I, I, if you could opine a little bit on the political sensitivities of the inequality <coughs> agenda. Inclusive growth or talking about the unequal poor is compelling and it's definitely stuff we want to program around but it's the easier side of the relationship to talk about, that the poor are not doing well because uh, they are not being included, and let's talk about that. But somebody is excluding them. The wealthy are, at, at some level, how we understand inequality. And so part of what we grapple with when we start to introduce relative words like inequality is not just how to frame better programming, such as we've heard some great ideas on for the poor, but how we grapple with the responsibilities of the powerful and the wealthy. And I think President Obama was speaking to that, and certainly the Pope was, when he stepped into the world of uh, let's collectively address inequality. But do you think that it's feasible to have serious conversation about the responsibilities of the wealthy and the powerful in doing their part to end extreme poverty? Uh, sure, and one of the, the nice things about appearing with uh, both friends and uh, folks who are in the government that I can always rely on them to cover the serious sober stuff and get a lot of the detail out, so I won't have to do that. And I can somewhat ignore Paul's question and have a bit of a flight of fancy with this. Uh, but first, I want to set the record straight, uh, and I'm sure reflecting the opinion of many other audience members. Alex, when we say developing country rich, I want to be eating endangered species with my gold fork on my Learjet on the way to my FIFA board meeting. I'm not talking 10% developing country rich. I'm talking all the way developing country rich. So just, I think that's where most of the audience is coming from, just for the record. Uh, so to talk about inequality, um, I'm going to cover some ground. I'm going to start and finish with my two, two of my very favorite studies from psychology. Uh, the first one uh, was done in the early 1990s. Uh, a series of researchers went into 40 homes. Uh, of families that had just had a child. Uh, one, it's a miracle uh, that anybody who just had a child invited a psychology researcher into their home <laughs> for three months, uh, uh, lending some questions about their overall intelligence. Uh, but what they found after three months was truly astounding, that they added up all the sounds and all the words that were said in all those households between poor households and affluent households. Uh, did some basic calculations, and the math came out that a kid in an affluent household in the United States hears 30 million more words by age three than a poor kid. 
30 million more words than a poor kid. Think of it. I mean, I think of it, and I came to realize that <laughs> perhaps I'd said, take that out of your mouth, don't hit your sister, and slow down a million times <laughs> each. <laughs> but it also, I think, leads to a pretty central observation about this. An awful lot of the discussion about inequality has been about income inequality. You know, and I think that is really looking at the wrong part of the elephant. I think things are so well cooked by the time that we're talking about income uh, that we're really missing the things that drive the landscape. The average kid from an affluent household in the United States scores 400 points higher on the SATs than a poor kid. The average uh, kid coming out of college versus a kid who's only graduated from high school is going to have double the hourly wage. And that's when they're maybe even still living in their parents' basement and haven't even really started thinking about income and career. Uh, so I think we really need, in all of these things, to think way upstream. You know, and in, to Paul's point about uh, how can we talk about this without talking about the responsibilities of the rich and the poor and uh, talking about the entitled class, you know, I don't blame any wealthy family or affluent family or however we want to categorize it for saying three million more words, 30 million more words to their kids. You know, that is natural. That is what you're going to do. You're going to give your kids and your family the advantage you can find. You know, and I think there is a lot of that dynamic and a lot of that that is entirely healthy and constructive. Uh, but pulling apart the pieces of the puzzle that are less constructive and less helpful, I think is is really important. Uh, and certainly I think this whole issue has become very political, uh, both on the international landscape and certainly in the United States. Uh, I think the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, did put inequality front and center uh, for a lot of people in the United States. Uh, but I think it also created, you know, and I work at a progressive think tank. Uh, I am all for reducing inequality. Uh, but I think when we talk about the issue in the United States, when we talk about it globally, uh, there's an awful lot of fog around these issues right now uh, because of how we talk about it and how political it has gotten. I think that there were a lot of Americans that reacted quite poorly to seeing people hang out uh, indefinitely and kind of scruffy in uh, parks here in Washington or uh, in lower uh, Manhattan around Wall Street. Uh, a lot of blue collar Americans who stand to be served by reducing inequality rejected some of the tactics that they saw. Uh, and I think that for a lot of people in the United States, when you talk about addressing inequality, it became code for redistribution. It became code for higher taxes. Uh, it became code for liberal democratic politics. The sense of opportunity, I think, was lost a lot of times in that discussion. Uh, the sense that there should be fundamental fairness. Uh, and I think that talking about opportunity and not just inequality is really important to kind of get some stability back into the debate uh, because as much as everyone recognizes that inequality needs to be addressed, we're not going to be address it, able to address it unless we have some political will to do it. Uh, you know, we're kind of in a funny moment right now that you've got uh, a bunch of Republican candidates running for president who've come out uh, and said that they uh, support addressing inequality. Uh, yet haven't moved their positions, I think, one iota from the stuff that kind of got us where we are today, uh, with no real cognitive dissonance from uh, some of those same candidates saying that uh, we perhaps misunderstood Mitt Romney when he talked about the 47% of folks who were just freeloading on the state uh, are now saying that we really need to address inequality. Uh, so I think there is a, a real disconnect here, but I think it's not just among right-wing Republicans. Uh, I think that there is a perception, particularly in the United States, but in lots of places in Europe, uh, that the dynamics of income inequality right now are really driven by CEOs collecting more and more money uh, and getting a bigger and bigger share 
and their employees getting a smaller and smaller piece of the pie. The data doesn't support that. What we see is not differences within companies, but really radical differences between companies. It isn't that the CEO of Apple is making so much more than the middle uh, rung and lower rung of Apple employees. It's that they're making so much more than McDonald's employees. The difference between Apple and McDonald's, between the corporate landscape, not just the United States, but around the world, has exploded. And I think that sometimes the, the really hot rhetoric on this issue tends to obscure the really complex things that are happening as our economies are really changing. How we value companies, how we value work. Uh, the fact that Google, the day that it became a company, uh, was worth more than IBM. These are profound shifts. Uh, and I think that what we're arguing about in the political sphere doesn't always begin to capture that very well. Uh, I think when we look at the developing world, I think Alex and Beth uh, captured a lot of the challenges there. Uh, but I, I think that in terms of how willing the Obama administration is uh, and able it is to tackle some of these things, you know, I think there's a couple areas that really stand out. Uh, the first, as Alex said, is domestic resource mobilization. Uh, developing countries able to uh, raise money, uh, have revenue to spend on their own people. Uh, but I would take it a little farther than Alex said. I think that it isn't just the importance of domestic resource mobilization, it's the importance of getting domestic resource mobilization right. Uh, fiscal policy is a very big piece of this pie. Uh, but there needs to be some basic contract in these countries. And in a lot of developing countries, there isn't faith there that if the government takes more of my money, you know, and it's not always faith here, that if the government takes more of my money, I'm going to see more public services. And asking people who are living on the threshold of extreme poverty uh, to give up 15% of their dollar a day or $2 a day or $10 a day into government, you know, they really need assurances that that means access to health care, that means there's going to be electricity, that means that there's going to be uh, roads, uh, and that there's going to be some accountability. Uh, so I think that uh, some compact at the, the state level in developing countries on domestic resource is really important. And I also think at the international level, that if we're going to say we really need to put a lot of emphasis on uh, developing countries uh, getting their policies on taxation and spending right, you know, we need to do much more to make sure that uh, multinational corporations are meeting their tax burden, uh, that people aren't just pushing money off into tax havens around the globe. We need to tighten up the international system so that developing countries can get a bigger piece of that pie of revenue that is rightly theirs. Uh, you know, the second part, obviously, that uh, everybody's touched on uh, is the idea of a more level playing field. Uh, in the developing world. Uh, and I think that the sustainable development goals as big and messy and way too many targets and unfocused as they are, uh, I think one of the real quiet successes of that process has been the ability to get some things that really go to addressing the needs of marginalized populations on the radar of the international community in a way that isn't the usual kind of the North hectoring the South. You know, you need democracy with a capital D. Uh, but the idea of uh, better access to land tenure, uh, rules that are not just in the book, but in practice. The idea that multilateral, uh, multinational corporations will clean up their supply chain and say, we won't source from anybody who's engaged in land grabbing. I think that's a big thing. The idea that everybody should have the right to a legal identity. Uh, that you should exist as a citizen in your country, that you have legal identity, that means that you could access public services, that you could perhaps have access to health care, that you could open a bank account, uh, that you couldn't just be forced out of your country and cross a border and be caught in some twilight netherworld where you never could come home again. Uh, the idea of budget transparency uh, has been, I think, uh, remarkably uncontroversial through uh, the sustainable development goals. So I give the administration of, and the international community as a whole a fair amount of credit for, and with a lot of help from civil society, for putting these issues fairly front and center. 
Uh, you know, another area that I think is really important, uh, where I think the U.S. government doesn't do very well, is looking at cash transfers. Uh, we've got a lot of evidence right now. Uh, we've seen big programs like Bolsa Familia in Brazil. Uh, they work. You know, the track record is really good. That if you set up a system, that if it's transparent and accountable, uh, you give money to women in the household, uh, you know, they don't go off and gamble it away. They don't drink it. Uh, the overhead is pretty manageable. And it has lifted lots of people out of extreme poverty. There's a lot of resistance to embracing cash transfers. Uh, uh, you know, I think probably the view within the development bureaucracy in the U.S. government is actually pretty far advanced. Um, but I think that there's very little willingness to take the risk of uh, traveling that extra mile up to the hill and saying, so what do you think about cash transfers? What, you're gonna give poor people money? What, that's horrific, how could you support that? Well, because it lifts them out of poverty in a lasting way. Uh, and there's a ton of data and evidence to support it. Uh, you know, I haven't really seen anybody sticking their head out of the rabbit hole in the administration uh, in favor of that. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I think that if we don't get on that bandwagon sooner or later, we're gonna be pretty isolated in terms of the development community because everybody else is moving in that direction. Mm. Uh, looking at the numbers in Afghanistan, uh, in terms of just economic assistance, this is not counting security assistance, and Lord knows what the number would look like if you count security assistance. Since uh, the fall of the Taliban, we have delivered, uh, we, the international community, has delivered the equivalent of more than $1,200 of economic assistance per Afghan. How much of that $1,244 do we think each Afghan has seen? I'm pretty skeptical that it's a big number. I'm pretty skeptical that it would crack 50%, uh, given the problem that we've had with aid programs, the issues with overhead of big international contractors and NGOs. You know, we've had some real historic success in Afghanistan, uh, particularly in areas like health and education, uh, but we've also had just some whoppers of programs and plans that were just an absolute disaster. Alex knows Afghanistan very well. He could run through a list and tell you which belongs in which category very neatly. Um, he probably won't do that unless you get a couple beers in him, uh, so don't try to do it today. Uh, but we need to look at new models uh, if we're gonna really try to deal with inequality in today's world. You know, and the last thing that Alex touched on is uh, not just disasters resilience and readiness, but also climate as a whole. Uh, climate is really bringing a hurting to uh, the poorest people who had absolutely nothing to do with driving emissions or climate change. They're absolutely the lowest end users of energy. They produce almost zero emissions, and they are absolutely the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Uh, and if we don't deal with that, and if we don't deal with that in a meaningful, large, global, creative way, all these other things that we're talking about inequality are just gonna be in quicksand. Uh, and so I, I'd close with, as I said, my second favorite psychology experiment. Uh, as a psych major, as an undergrad. Uh, and one of the studies every psych major has to do at some point is uh, the basic reward behavior. You put a rat in a box, it's called a Skinner box after B.F. Skinner. Uh, he presses a little, he learns to press a little bar, and a little food pellet comes down. It's a classic experiment. It's very highly effective in conditioning behavior. Uh, one of the schools where they were doing this experiment, one of the researchers noticed that the rat was getting fed, but periodically the box would shake. And he couldn't figure out what was going on and why the box would shake. Uh, and you're not really supposed to open it up because you kind of ruin the laboratory conditions if you look in on the rat as it's doing this thing. But finally, the curiosity got the better of the researcher. And it seems what was happening was that this rat had, I'm sure accidentally the first time it happened, had stood at one end of the box, run full tilt at the other side of the box, hit the box hard enough that a pellet was dislodged. So instead of hitting the bar to get his food pellets, he figured, well, if I run all the way across the box, hit my head, I get fed. And it worked for him. 
Uh, and it was even more powerful because it didn't happen every time, and intermittent reinforcement is really the most powerful. And I fear that in trying to change inequality and really address it globally, we're a little bit that particular rat in a box. We've set up a global system that it kind of works for us. It works on most days. If we stand on one side of the box and run full tilt at it, we get that food pellet. Things happen. Uh, there is growth. But I think a lot of things that we're talking about are a much more profound shift in how we think, how we act, and how we go about our politics at a time when change is really coming really, really fast. Uh, and I think that is a challenge for all of us internationally and domestically. Thanks. Great. So maybe a hand for our three panelists. There they are again. Okay. That was super. I hope you now... Uh, by, I'm, I'm sure you, you wouldn't have been in this room if you weren't open to the idea that inequality is worth grappling with, um, that it's growing, and that there are things that we can do about it. But I'm going to ask these guys a question, then I'm going to turn to you and see if we could ask some crisp and provocative questions to keep them uh, engaging with you. And we'll try and end a little early, but not too much beforehand. And so please stay with us uh, through the last 20 minutes or so. Um, here's the thing I, I want to observe coming away from the, the, your three sets of comments. Um, John, your last, I loved your last metaphor. The way I choose to hear it is there is an inescapable logic to what is going on in the world right now, which is that the divide between the extremely wealthy and the extreme poor is increasing. The debate over whether markets are going to drive most poverty reduction is basically over. The answer is yes. But the question as to whether they are adequately regulated to ensure that the rising tide risks all boats is increasingly manifestly no. So that's, that was Alex's comment at the beginning. If, if your societies are already so unequal that Dangote in Nigeria has $19 billion in wealth, then when Nigeria and the rest of Africa grows at more than 5%, where does the money go? The money goes there. So from 1996 until, actually 2006 until the last time it was measured, the number of people in extreme poverty in Africa has gone up, not down, even though the continent is growing. That's the math. And even though Oxfam sometimes likes to, because we get attention, to point out who's the evil actor, let's put that aside. Let's assume that John is right, that people aren't mean to speak three million words to their kids or to use the power of money to maybe shape political elections the way they'd like them to go or to try and change the future of their countries in ways that serve them. Let's not accuse them of being evil. The fact is they have that level of power now. So our development challenge is getting more and more political, whether we like it or not. It's not what it once was about transferring as much stuff as we could from where it sat to where it ought to be. It's about the challenge of getting institutions to work effectively and have not just the capacity, which is a technical issue, but the political will to function effectively. And so the question I want to put back to you guys is, if that's all true, if I haven't said anything that's new or really interesting there, you have actors, it's a increasingly a political and institutional challenge. You've got actors, what you might call at the top of the food chain, who are not evil, but are under-regulated. They are able to capture the wealth of the big energy deals, the oil money. They are not being progressively taxed. They are able to influence the outcomes of elections or lobbying in the United States so that that spiral continues. And the most effective channel to ensure that there's better regulation is the people of their own countries in responsible ways asking for transparency and holding them to account, civil society space. If that's true, that they're, it's not their fault, but they're being underregulated, and folks need to be able to hold them accountable in their own countries, then my questions start back with Alex uh, and Beth. Alex, first, do you buy it? And two, is it going to put a burden on USAID to become a more politically sophisticated institution as it takes on these challenges of increasingly political nature? 
Um, I know I'd love you to speak to your new mission statement in that regard and what does it really mean? And sort of the same question to you. As you, you framed out that the heart of your analytic exercise that you laid out so eloquently is identifying the binding constraints that are preventing the right kinds of growth from happening in those countries, but is the nature of that analysis increasingly going to become a more sort of political analysis? Like the binding constraint here is corruption or under-regulation of the oil or energy sector or whatever it is, so you've got to strengthen institutions that might not want to be strengthened the way that, that you, you might want to help them, and how do you deal with that? So let's sort of get us going, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. Alex, do you buy it? Uh, well, you know, I think that, the, I, I know that you believe this, uh, but I'm just going to say it. I mean, development is political, and if you don't think so, you're in the wrong business. And so it doesn't matter whether you're investing in health systems or in education systems or uh, in market-driven solutions to food security. Um, all of those have political consequences, they affect political actors. And so one goal for us in thinking about what it means for USA to be dedicated to the cause of ending extreme poverty, which as Paul said, uh, we refashioned our mission statement. Uh, of course, many of us believe that in many ways, in most ways, USA has always been about the goal of addressing poverty and extreme poverty. Uh, but about a year and a half ago, we explicitly changed our mission statement to say we're we partner to end extreme poverty and to promote resilient and democratic societies. Those two twin goals which are intertwined and fundamental to what we're talking about here today. Um, but you can't be serious about that objective uh, without being serious about the mechanics of what drives inequality in countries um, and who succeeds and who doesn't uh, gain from, from development. So, that leads us in a couple of, let me just speak for one second, be very tangible. Um, so one teaser that I will put out there is that we have been actively working for the last couple of months on developing a vision statement for ending extreme poverty for USAID. Uh, that document uh, is going to be available for public comment soon. In that document, which is brief, we attempt to state a bit of a theory of the case about what ends extreme poverty and what we think can be done about it from the perspective of a development agency like USAID. Uh, so that's an invitation. I wish I could say it was out now, but keep refreshing your browser. It will be out soon, um, and we really uh, welcome public comment. <clears throat> But part of what we're advocating in that document, which I'll just share with you, is that if we're going to be serious, we have to know where the extreme poor are, why they remain extremely poor, and what can be done to get to them directly. Um, and that's not, a straight, that's not an entirely straightforward answer. If you are working on a program, you have to be able to identify who the poorest of the poor are, but again, ending extreme poverty is not just about focusing only on the poorest of the poor. It's about addressing the mechanics um, within the economy and within the society that promote inclusive growth. Uh, so we know, for example, that small and medium enterprise is one of the greatest generators um, of, of economic growth due to increased employment. Um, so what are the sorts of the things that Beth was already talking about, the sorts of constraints to growth, the things within the system that prevent small and medium enterprises from getting access to credit, from getting access to energy, from having a sufficiently trained workforce uh, to be able to uh, provide jobs, from being able to avoid paying bribes, from being able to get access uh, to markets. Uh, one just quick anecdote, I was in Haiti not too long ago looking at a food security project focusing on mangoes. Haiti's got beautiful mangoes. Uh, unfortunately, from the tree to the city, let alone from the city to the ports, the ports to other countries, uh, that is a long and twisted path for that mango. They come off the trees modeled. Uh, they get damaged on the road to town. Uh, they do not have the biosecurity standards that are necessary uh, to, to, to take them to markets abroad. 
Those are small, tangible, but really important processes and you've got to deal with every single one of them along the way. And there are often problems of entrenched actors along that path that are going to prevent the, the good mango from getting to Whole Foods. I wish I could show you because I actually do have on my phone, I was at my Whole Foods the other day where they sell uh, Haitian mangoes, which has been part of this USAID project. Um, and 50 bucks each. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> invest, invest in Haitian mangoes, and they're delicious. But, but the point is that they're, they're, those paths exist and can be built, but they are hard. And what's hard about them is not just having enough money. It's about doing the political economy analysis. It's about doing the inclusive uh, growth analysis, the constraints analysis that lets you understand what it is going to take to unlock the type of growth that is actually going to get mango farmers in Haiti out of extreme poverty. And if we don't understand it at that level, um, then we're not going to get there. Yeah. And that means investment. And it means changing the way that we think as development actors. Um, and it means investment in data and willingness to let that data lead us where we need to go. Um, and it needs serious work. I mean, John mentioned this, and I just have to say it because obviously the work that we do and the money we spend comes from the American people. And if, if their representatives do not believe in the things that we need to do to address ending extreme poverty, uh, then we're going to be in trouble. And everybody here uh, is a megaphone for your communities to be able to talk about how important these goals are. Good. OK, I'm asking you guys to put on your pithy hats henceforth so that we can get some questions in. Should um, I be pithy about this? Be, be pithy about binding constraints and whether your analysis is changing. Um, the question I asked earlier on, I don't need to repeat it. Well, are you, are you getting more politically, are you having uh, well, to get more the, politically I mean, I, sophisticated? Right, as you so I mean, I think, I think yes. I, I think that the sort of the constraints analysis tool itself is not necessarily the place to get more sophisticated about things like political economy analysis, which I wrote PEA just as it came out of Alex's mouth. So we're really on the same wavelength again. Um, but I, I think that um, what we're increasingly seeing in our compacts is that um, exactly what Alex pointed out, which is that it's not just understanding what the problem is, it's understanding why it's a problem. And if you don't, if you don't get to the why, then, then you can't get to the how and actually be effective. Um, mm. And I mean, I'll say a couple things. One is, you know, if you look at our compacts, they include all sorts of conditionality. Um, and I, I won't say, you know, sometimes our partner countries might think it's overly onerous conditionality um, and that we're putting up all of these hurdles. But I think the point is, is that we've realized, um, and, and again, not rocket science, that we can't just be money. We can't just drop infrastructure in a country. We have to be money plus, right? We have to be the infrastructure and the policy and institutional reform that is going to support the infrastructure after we leave. We're in a country for five years. Um, maybe we're in for another five years if we have a second compact, but maybe we're not. So we have five years, and what can you really achieve in five years beyond infrastructure? You can set the stage for better policy making in a country where there's the will to do it. And mm -hmm. I think one of the ways you create the will, of course, is through this incentive structure, which is here's a very large compact. Um, it, will, it will be yours if, if you know, these certain conditions are met, if you set up certain checks and balances to make sure that funding is spent, is spent well. And I'll say that you know, one of the things that really struck me, I was, I was visiting a country that we're developing a compact with um, and sitting around the table with a number of donors in the energy space. And one of our, our, the European donors in the energy space said something along the lines of, well, I know that my money is okay when I give it to the energy utility. It goes into a separate account and you know they're accountable to us so I know exactly how it's spent. I'm not worried about that. And I sort of looked at him and said, well, you just care about your money? <laughs> you know, it's not, we, we obviously need to care about our money. It's US taxpayer money and we're responsible to, to the citizens of the United States to make sure it's used effectively. But I think that our approach is really to care about 
this, the money that belongs to the citizens of that country, right? You want their money to be spent well in addition to our money being spent well because it's their money that's going to carry these projects forward, that's going to ensure there's maintenance for the roads, that's going to ensure that the, the transmission lines aren't falling down, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to make sure that the water and sanitation systems continue to function. It's not going to be us, it's going to be them. And that's where the domestic resource mobilization aspect comes into this. This is where the policy and institutional reform comes into this. This is where those hard political decisions that need to be made come into it. Um, and I absolutely agree. That's, that is the way forward, as, you, as everyone has pointed out. Um, we are not going to go and develop countries. We can spur development. We can catalyze development. Uh, but it's that catalytic effect um, that needs to be our focus. Um, and, and we need to ask ourselves, how can what we do be sustained going forward? That's great. Okay, John, I'm going to ask you to speak to the first questions, but let's take some comments, questions, actually really questions, if I could ask you. Uh, please identify yourself. I think we have mics up here. If you wouldn't mind stepping up to them, that would be great. Uh, identify yourself and ask a question. We'll take a few, and then we'll, uh, um, we'll ask the panelists to reflect on them. Why don't we start here with James? Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is James Ladikbo Williams. I'm an international student from Lagos, Nigeria. I thank you guys for your honest and accurate references to the country throughout your presentation. And we do f what we do see is that you know the country is really growing at a fa fast pace, about seven percent. But like you said, the growth that we're seeing is not inclusive. And on ground, you have Nigerians petitioning the federal government to take action to create conditions for inclusive growth. And my question to you guys is, do you think that federal policy is what a country like Nigeria needs at this time? Or should we be looking at the state and local governments to see if they, too, have a role to play in you creating federal Nigerian policy as opposed to state and local policy in Nigeria? Yes, because people yeah. on ground are, okay. at least with the last administration, were on good luck, Jonathan, that, hey, you've messed up things. We aren't, we're not seeing the monies on the average, in the pockets of the average Nigerian. So my question is, should we be looking at what our governors and local council members are doing as it relates to addressing income inequality, or should we just focus all our energies toward you know, the federal government and what it can do to create an enabling environment for inclusive growth? Thanks, James. Thank you. Great. Hi, Thank Tiernan you. Menon with Comonix International. Kind of want to take that point and dovetail it with mine and take it even lower to the individual level. I'm not quite sure how we can talk about in, unequal uh, growth or, or equal growth without talking about rights. Um, I think it was, it was kind of ignored. No one mentioned rights until John got to land rights. And, and I think that's a critical issue that needs to be looked at, particularly when you're talking about systematic, uh, equal, and sustainable growth. Um, so I'd, I'd like you guys to talk a bit about that. And I'd also like to see if you could link it to this discussion on resource mobilization because those two points are clearly linked. Resource mobilization, if the emphasis is placed on that, often means governments will look for ways to get greater investment in land and will get involved in land grabbing. They will uh, increase their amount of access to natural resources uh, lying on the property of the poor and evict the poor and the poor end up in slumps. So you can't just talk about resource mobilization and to, 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 to spur growth without looking at rights. And so That's I'd like to, like to hear you guys talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Chloe. Hi. Uh, Chloe Schwenke from Georgetown, the McCourt School of Public Policy. Uh, one word I really haven't heard much spoken, maybe not at all, is the word public. And I'm trying to get a sense of, with all this talk about economic growth and incentives and disincentives towards economic growth, why is there no conversation about cohering a public, cohering a public sense, a sensibility that particularly those with power and with money would fail some sense of obligation too. We've had a lot of conversation about the role of civil society and being there to hold accountable upwards, but what about elites' obligations around uh, cohering a public, creating a place where it actually feels this is our society, uh, having a conversation where the words public service don't sound silly. Um, that happened in other countries, and we don't seem to have that conversation in this current panel, as important as what we have discussed is, I don't take that away for a minute, but isn't there a layer missing here? Thank you. Thank you. Hi. 
didn't catch uh, Go ahead and take those. I may have three questions. <laughs> you have three. Well, I'll tell you what. We've only got about 11 minutes left. So let's get your questions in. We'll get okay. to as many of them as we can. We're going to have one more go from each of these so guys. It, um, my question has to do with the level of um, strategic planning at um, different levels, um, district, state, regional, uh, country level uh, planning and examples of that. Um, well, uh, Vietnam increased it, lowered its poverty rate from 70% to 30%, and it did that because it had a goal to do that, and it, you know, implemented, you know, their different five-year plans. Um, in Oregon, we had an Oregon Shines, Shines report, and we created uh, benchmarks, and then we fed those goals by 2015 or 2030. Into, into legislation to actually act on it. And uh, one innovation in Oregon uh, for 25 years was Oregon Growth Account, which was public monies spent to seed venture startup capital uh, businesses for Oregon to grow. Um, so, so good question. National plans and subnational work. I'm going to give you one more question, so pick your okay. favorite. So, um, so it's about reforming the corporate model. And uh, we've got two organizations here that represent the cooperative movement in the United States and overseas, um, employee-owned, owner-owned, member-owned uh, economic uh, as an alternative to the corporate model. Are we going to need to think differently about the corporate model if yeah. we're going to tackle this? That's great. Thanks, Laurie. OK, you've got some great questions there. And this is going to be probably the last round. Uh, federal, subnational, take them. I'm going to ask John to go first, if you could take two. Um, and I'm just, then you guys are going to have to be nimble with what remains. Federal, subnational, rights, public, national planning, and uh, the need to reform the corporate model. Yeah, uh, John. I can do some of them to kind of mix together. The, yep. the public part, uh, the corporate model, kind of how we look at all this. The global architecture part of it, I think, is really important. Uh, I think it's really vital not to think of this as a new thing. Governments and business have been in a cat and mouse game for centuries. That there's an innovation, the private sector moves in, they take advantage, they overreach, and then there's a course correction. We had monopolies established in the Gilded Age as they figured, well, if we own the coal mine and the railroad and the people who sell it, we'll do really well. Monopolies were broken up. Well, we can do really well in factories with really cheap immigrant labor coming into this country and give them no social protection whatsoever. Triangle shirtwaist fire kills scores of people. The American labor movement leaps up. Now we've got a system where corporations are incredibly fast and nimble and able to take advantage of a truly global landscape. They execute trades on Wall Street in milliseconds. The advantage that getting your trade in a millisecond ahead of your competitor is often the difference. They'll do things that are a fraction of a penny higher bid than their nearest competitor to take advantage of that. They can find the country that is willing, <coughs> Ireland, to give them the lowest available tax rate. I'm a proud and say, this week. Oh, well, we established headquarters in Dublin. <laughs> and so, you know, it's natural. They're taking advantage of it. But what I think is really a stern challenge is that to deal with that kind of system requires a series of multilateral agreements to tighten up the system. You know, all of our work so far has been set up on a national level to regulate companies and how they behave. You know, there are some international standards, but now we have to figure out how you establish a global playing field that kind of works for everybody, and that's hard and complex, and that's where the push it needs to happen. That's lovely. Beth? Oh, I hit just a few of these things. One, on the issue of subnational, um, that's something we have put some thought into, um, although not certainly as much thought as, as we would need to in order to actually, actually act on it. But I think you make a really important point um, about, uh, about not just looking at national governments and instead looking at, at some of the um, regional governments and, and state governments that are out there that could potentially be good partners um, for the U.S. government. So uh, that's a really good point. Um, I think on the issue of rights, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that uh, the the 
points that I was making about the correlation between more equitable growth and good governance um, captures some of that. And I think it's it's true that um, that the types of things that we see in societies that are that are uh, more supportive of their poor um, are things like uh, actually extending rights to people so that they can interact with their government a bit more. Um, and I think that's you know one of the one of the reasons why um, transparency is is such a core pillar of what we do is it's not just transparency to U.S. stakeholders, it's transparency to stakeholders on the ground and encouraging the, the partners on the ground to actually be transparent about what's being spent, why it's being spent, and what it's actually achieving so that the citizens in those countries can hold their own governments accountable. That's gonna be the key to this, is, is, is um, as, as Paul would say, that sort of compact between citizens and their governments. Mm. See, I've learned well. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I guess that, that sort of relates to the, the idea of the public as well, um, which is it's very hard to have this notion of a public that can influence policy and the direction of a country if the transparency aspect of it isn't there. Um, and so I think that that needs to be something that's woven into everything that the US government is doing overseas, that, that notion of providing um, not just our own information, but empowering people to sort of seek out information, helping them to use it, um, there's a, a whole movement around uh, big data and open data, but that data is hardly accessible to a lot of the people who need to use it most. Um, and so, you know, the future of that needs to be as, as much data supply as data accessibility, really. Um, and I think that that's where we'll start to see sort of strong publics being mm -hmm. created in countries that can actually hold their governments accountable for, for progress. Nice. Thank you. Alex. Uh, well, I think there's almost nothing left, but I will just say I think something that reinforces what, what both of uh, my colleagues on the panel just said, which is that, you know, the, the thing that kind of pulls through all of these questions, which is always like, there, uh, you know, there's one iron law to development, and that is local ownership. Uh, we're not the answer. None of you are the answer, except maybe our colleague from Nigeria. You might have to go home and be the answer. but. Um, <laughs> The, 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 the truth is, is that it's, it's, it's citizens that are the answer. Um, and so the question about local governance, I think, is critical because, yes, we, we do invest in local governance and capacity development and strengthening their ability to budget. Nigeria has actually been a great example where a lot of our best successes have been because there have been great actors at the subnational level that we can, that we can partner with. Um, and that's always important because local governments, particularly in a federal system, are close to their people, and that's often where the best degree of accountability can be, can be driven from. Uh, but I also want to give both a, 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 a plug to the fact that, you know, people in the private sector, people in business are also citizens. And one of the things that I think that has been really interesting in the past couple of years is that getting away from this idea of corporate social responsibility, which is a good idea, but really doesn't answer the mail. Um, what answers the mail is this fundamental concept of shared value, that corporations should not, because they're doing a mine and so they build a school next to it, but because the way that they run the mine actually treats the workers right and treats the environment right. That's what we ultimately need in this country, in every country that we're talking about. And that idea of, of fundamental shared value or double bottom line or whatever you want to call it, that, that corporations and corporate partners can be good partners in development, not on the side, but in the mainstream of how they conduct their business needs to be fundamental. Because if they're not going to be hiding their taxes or shifting their profits or doing whatever, it's going to come in part from legal regulation and multilateral agreements. But it's also going to come from people doing the right thing. And that's one of the most, things that we've, the most interesting things we've seen in this country. When corporations like Walmart, I mean Walmart of all companies, step up and say, we're going to green our supply chain. When Starbucks says we're not going to hide all of our profits in the Netherlands, not because they necessarily had to or the UN wagged their finger at, finger at them, but they decided that ultimately for the long term mm -hmm. and for their own sake it was the right thing to do, that's the kind of change that will also be <laughs> profound. Uh, and so that sort of ethic needs to be brought through local governance as well as corporate governance. And I think that that's where some of the longest term change is going to come from. Fantastic. Wow, well, I, <laughs> Oxfam's been thinking about inequality for a couple of years now, but I learned 
an awful lot listening to these guys and hearing your questions. I wish we'd had time for more. We're just about out of time. Um, I, I, you, one of the reasons I learned a lot for me today is the reality of inequality is not going away. It's going to get worse. It's going to tear our world apart in places and leave people behind at a time of such immense opportunity where we really could collectively do amazing things unless it is grappled with. But if you talk about it in stupid ways, you'll be dismissed or you'll be a sloppy ideologue and you won't actually serve the people you come to serve. If you talk about it in too euphemistic ways, you won't get to the real problems that are, are undermining our ability to address the issue. So it's going to take sophistication, and that was one of the reasons why I got so much out of hearing these guys today and hearing your questions. I hope that you agree that it's a conversation worth continuing, because we certainly do not have all the answers. And I just want to thank you for having spent the time and been in the room so evidently. And I hope that you uh, bring the conversation forward in your own worlds as we grapple with these new development challenges. So if you could join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. And I know you have a little bit of a breather. It was scheduled for four to be back in plenary. I think they're expecting 4.10 to actually uh, have the next presentation in the main room. So time for a quick coffee and a break. But we will be convening in the main room. Thank you very much. Great job. Great job, guys.